As of right now, no one has February for Donut Sunday. Somebody needs to sign up.
in Pittsburgh. Did you hear the story? That was fantastic. He told his players to get out and start and shovel driveways if anybody was shut in or elderly or whatever. And so the players went out and got their work out by doing that. And I thought that was a fantastic thing that the coach thought of. I don't know who he is or anything about him. But and that they was weren't good. allowed to accept any money yeah, for doing that. That was the other thing. Yeah, no money for doing that. They actually made it as far as onto the Franklin Graham website. So it was it was worldwide. Okay, fantastic. Anything else? Darlene's heart calf came back good. Yes. Yes, she had a good report on the heart calf. Um, so that, that's very good. My nephew, my nephew is at Pittsburgh Hospital. He's there since before Christmas. They moved him up number two on the transplant list for heart. He's okay. not doing good at all. Yeah, number Butch's nephew who's in Pittsburgh. He's been in the hospital since Christmas, and he's the second one on the list for a heart transplant. So please pray for pray for him. Any others? Remember Dave Pineapple? He had yep. surgery this week. <coughs> I forget Dave. Any, anything else? Juanita. Yes, member Juanita, uh, member Sandy Mountain as well. Um, Mama Jan. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, member, member Jan. She didn't get home from her hospital run, but uh, remember her. <coughs> they treat one thing and they call it another problem. And that's a and scary so, problem. Yes. Mom. Stress test. Stress test. Been canceled twice because of the weather. Maybe Friday. <laughs> okay, Friday, Friday for the third time. Um, let's say third time to charm. So Friday we'll try again for his stress test on his heart. That just means get ready for the next snowstorm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we have. Plus we're trying to do that. It's been a snowstorm. I love the grace of the Lord. My blood count. Last couple months was 12.8. This time it was 13.3. Wow, fantastic. Good. And the Lord has his hand upon me. I don't know how it went like that, but yeah. I praise him. Amen. Amen. Because if you remember a situation, it kept going down, down, and down. And so we praise God for that. Anything else? I just want to praise the Lord for everything. Amen. Um, I, and I'm still a horrible human being. <laughs> so, and, and, and God knows I'm a horrible human being. And that's why we need Jesus. 
all horrible human beings. And uh, I just, I just can't thank him enough for his taking me out of a family that didn't have anybody saying Jesus is the answer. And he he lifted me up, and and I've seen member after member after member of my family coming around, and it, it, I just praise Jesus for his love and his mercy and his grace and all that he does <laughs> for all of us. Yeah, yeah. Whether we see it or we don't. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to praise God. Um, Thea's been up at college in Clarion now since August, and she's She's all, always had gone to church, and she's been struggling with where to go. She, her roommate is a Catholic, so she went there, and she wasn't happy with that. But she said she found a church, Amen. and she was going to go this morning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's hard to do sometimes. You're used to a certain church, certain kind, and trying to find one that satisfies sometimes is hard. And spoke of the request you have and want to lift for the Lord. And we'll send our prayer for us now. not just something we have, but it's in the person of Jesus, the living Christ, the resurrected Lord who lives in us, and you are our peace. Father, we ask you to hear the many requests today, hear the praises of your people, thanking you for what you've done. Thank you for those who have served and reached out and helped others, Lord, by shoveling snow and, and doing all these things to help. We thank you for that, Father. We thank you for all the good things you've done in our lives. We praise you for we are redeemed. You, bought, you paid the price that we could go free to serve you. Father, hear all these requests, all these unspoken requests, Father. You know those as well. We pray for Butch's nephew, Lord, who's needing a heart transplant, Lord, that you would be with him and strengthen him, help him, Lord, as he is on this waiting time of anxiety, Lord. May he know your peace. And Father, we pray for Butch that you would open up the weather and let him be able to go to have the stress test uh, this time. Father, you know everything. All things are in your hands. We ask you to help Jan, Lord, that you would touch her, Father, and, and all that she's going through health-wise. And touch Sandy Mountain and continue to lift up her spirits and strengthen her body, Lord, and let her be back to the house and back to the house of God. Lord, for space for each unspoken request, Lord, that's heavy on our hearts that we can't voice. Lord, we ask that you would hear those as well. Lord, bring your answers. Do what only you can do, Lord. 
We look to you for help and for hope, Lord. Help those who are struggling with hope, Lord, to find hope in you. Holy Spirit, come and meet our needs this morning as we're in this place, as we worship you. Speak from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. chapter 12, asking the question, how do you define or how do you measure success? Because if you define it the wrong way, you may achieve it, but really only be a failure. So how do you define success? What means success to you? Uh, and in that, uh, most people in the world, at least, money would be the biggest thing for success. If I have lots of money, I'm successful. So we have a little video, and just understand this is not real. This is uh, sarcasm humor, I guess, if you will. Uh, so don't try to go to this website. It's not in existence. Go ahead and play that, please. Relationships may come and go, but the one thing that's constant in my life are my shoes. I love shoes. My mom's always saying, aren't you tired of keeping up with the Joneses? I don't know who they are, but they'd be jealous if they can see my new boat. Where do you go when the relationships don't seem to give you satisfaction? You turn to your stuff, right? It's okay. Everybody does it. Shoes are awesome. Shoes are fun. And they're always there for you, supporting your arches and loving you and saying nice things to you and not making fun of you or saying you're dumb or ugly or stupid and leaving you in the middle of a really hardcore relationship. I'm Dr. Lee Pofe, founder of NeedHarmony.com. I've had the sincere pleasure of helping millions of you find that perfect someone, only to find some of you coming back for a second time, and some of you 12 or 20 times. Why don't we skip the relationship headache and hold on to the stuff we want to worship? Welcome to GreenHarmony.com. When relationships get old and boring, we have to find something else to do. We attend a lot of Star Trek conventions. Mm. Green Harmony gets us a good price on tickets and transportation. But I gotta be honest with you, I'd spend all the money I had to to get a distraction from this thing. I wish I could go all the way to Nebulous 5, but that technology currently only exists in science fiction. You know, prize eat a cupcake. Never leave your house and feel the cold sting of social interaction. It's all at your fingertips. Everything you can afford, or can afford, that's what credit's for. Who says you can't take it with you? We can. We bought a casket for one. Both of us will be in it, and so will all our stuff. Thank you, Great Harmony. We did? Yes, we did. I love you, Lulu. This relationship is so boring. I can use the force. It don't work on me anymore. We can buy something. OK. I'm getting a new favor. I'm getting a new boyfriend. <laughs> that goes with money. How we can afford that? I don't matter. It doesn't matter if we can't afford it. Someone bails out. No, be, no. This my window. Turn the camera off. Turn it off right let's just, now. Let's just hug it out. We got to... Turn it off. Turn it off. Who could separate a fool from his riches? No way, thanks to Greek Harmony. In fact, to prove that, I'm going right now to purchase things I don't need, using money I don't have to impress people I don't even love. So what are you waiting for? You're already in the habit of spending rather than saving. We've just made it simple for you. Hey, we're no dummies. We want your money as much as your 401k does. And guess who's winning that battle? So do what millions have already done. Spend your life away, or at least your life savings. Come to GreenHarmony.com and let us sell you a whole new life of compromise. Green Harmony. There's another harmony that I think I can't even think of the name of now for just so much. What's it called? It's not the harmony. E-harmony. 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 That's what it is. Okay. Uh, in, in the gospel, Jesus has an interaction with someone in the gospel of Luke chapter 12. Um, and it sounds pretty up to date. It sounds pretty normal uh, for what we would expect today or hear today uh, if Jesus was here. And so in verse 13, 
It says, someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me as a judge or an arbitrator between you, an arbiter between you? And then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable or story. The ground of a certain rich man yielded a, an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life or your soul will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? And then he asks the question, or he makes the statement, this is how it will be for anyone or whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not <coughs> rich towards God. Who stores up things for themselves, this is how it will be but is not rich towards God. Heavenly Father, help us to understand success that doesn't come from Hollywood or from some advertisement that's constantly bombarding our senses, but let us hear what true success is that comes from you. You who made the world, you who know everything, you all-wise, all-knowing God, show us today that we may be a success in your eyes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How do you define success? What does it have to include? What's the goal of your life? What do you need to say that you're successful? It's different for everyone, but for most people, it's do you have a good job, a nice car, a nice home, a good income, a spouse, uh, children, nice clothes, good health, fat bank account, or just be the envy of all your friends, and then have lots of friends. Uh, but today, if, if people were said, what do you need to have to be successful, what would they say? Anybody have an idea what you have to have to be successful today? What did the advertisements tell you? Money, car, and a big house. Um, that money, car, and a big house? What's the one you see most often right now? Your phone. How many phone commercials have you seen lately? They tell you you need our phone. Um, and there's the new Galaxy Z Fold 3. You can have it for only $1,900. And, and your life will never be the same if you buy this $1,900 phone. Uh, or maybe you need a new car, a Lamborghini that costs $1.5 million. That would really make me feel successful, wouldn't it, you? I'd be afraid to drive it, afraid that I would scratch it or something else. Or a motorcycle. I've seen the most expensive Harley that you can buy right now is a custom Starship Harley, original paint, custom painted for $1.5 million. Oh, sorry, the Lamborghini was $4.5 million. Or you can buy a boat, a yacht. I mean, nothing says success like a yacht. Everybody has to have a yacht if you're successful. You can buy the best one for $4.8 billion, the History Supreme. It was the most expensive. It has 10,000 kilograms of solid gold and platinum. Both which adorn the dining area, the deck, the rails, the staircases, and the anchor. For only $4.5 billion. And I started looking at the other thing you have to have. You have to have the, the latest and greatest TV if you're successful. And, and I thought 80 inches was as big as you could get, but I looked it up and I was wrong. You can now get 100 inches or 98 inches. And uh, you can get the Ultra HD 4K 
uh, the best one they have, the NEC, and it's only $13,000. But you can be successful. You can see your TV shows. Now, your team may still not win, but they'll look better when you're watching it. It's $13,000 TV. And for people like me, think about buying a kundo. I mean, nothing says success like having the best kundo. Stylish Anna went for $20,000. Her son, Balls Harry, went for $30,000. Because they can run a coon to a tree better than anyone else can. But which one's successful? Let me ask you a question of a parable that Jesus said. Jesus said, which is successful? There was a rich man who was dressed in the finest clothes and lived in luxury every day. And a very poor man or a homeless man, a beggar named Lazarus, whose body was covered with sores and lay at the rich man's gate. He, the beggar, wanted to eat only the small pieces of food that fell from the rich man's table, and the dogs would come and lick his sores. Which one was successful? The world would say the rich man was successful. He had all the stuff. He had all the abundance. But you know what leveled the playing field? You know when success really became very plain? When they both died. Death is the leveling field. And it said the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man died and was buried. And in hell he was in torment and looked up and saw Abraham afar off with Lazarus by his side. And he says, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. Now we would have said the rich man was successful before death, but after death, it's the beggar, the one who had nothing, not even enough to eat. But he ended up being the one who was successful. We call success as the one who is rich, has Italian shoes, tailored suit, his money's invested, his plastic is platinum, he flies first, first class. Everything is just right. He's young. He's got a flat belly. That makes it all better. Or there can be the second person who's gifted. He's called, served as an elder, a Sunday school teacher. He knows his Bible, committed to the Great Commission. He shares his faith, a man of prayer, raising his, his family and church. But he's never owned a home. His car's a rattle trap. There's no money in the bank. And he barely gets by. And the world says the rich man with the tailored suits and the fancy shoes, he's successful. This other guy just barely gets by. He's not successful. But Jesus says something here that he says success is not the accumulation of material things. But we say success is the accumulation of material things. Our world all around us says that. The definition of success is simply this. Uh, you make sure that you get all that's yours. Like the men in the crowd who say, our parents passed away and there's an inheritance and, and my brother's not divided enough with me. Make him. Give me my share of the money. And you think Jesus would just say to his brother, just share evenly. I mean, like we would say, just, just split it evenly. But he says something else. That kind of attacks the idea of demand your own rights. Don't let anyone cheat you. Getting your way is most important. Material things are more important than relationships. You can always get more friends. Just get the money. Win at any cost. Look out for number one. Nobody else will look out for me. I will look out for myself. She owns a string of hotels. She owns the Empire State Building. She's a billionaire, and yet in September 1989, Leona Helmsley was convicted of 33 counts of tax evasion, which she spent time in prison. According to Time Magazine, when she came out of prison, she was a penny pension tyrant who tried to stiff about everybody. No amount of money was too small to fight over. She's a billionaire. After the sudden death of her son at age 40 in 1982, she sued and won a lion's share of his estate for $149,000.
She left his four children with $432 apiece and his widow with $2,171. She would say, as Gordon Gecko on the famous movie Wall Street, greed is good. Greed is good, but Jesus says, no, greed is not good. Jesus tells the man who's trying to get his brother to share the inheritance, he says, beware of all kinds of greed. Beware. Be on guard. Gambling is built on greed, and all we hear now is all about gambling. Every other commercial seems like it's either your telephone or it's this new casino has, we'll take your money. Just come and gamble with us. It'll be so much fun, and we'll get so much richer. Greed is good, our world says. Grab all you can. Grab all the gusto. Take all you can. But Jesus says that greed is evil. He says that in 1 Corinthians 6 that the greedy will not inherit the kingdom of God. But greed has become the plague on American society. The examples of greed are, are crazy. In fact, they asked Americans, and two-thirds of Americans would do one of these seven things for $10 million. What would you do for $10 million? That's greed. 25% of Americans said they would abandon their family for $10 million. 25% would abandon their church. I figured it might be higher than that. 16% would give up their American citizenship for $10 million. 16% would leave their spouse for $10 million. 10% said they would withhold testimony and let a murderer go free for $10 million. 7% said they would kill a stranger for $10 million. 3% said they'd put their children up for adoption if somebody would give them $10 million. You see, greed is the killer of all gratitude. If you're greedy, you can't ever be grateful. You can't be thankful for what you have if you're always greedy for something more. You can either be greedy or you can be grateful, but you can't be both at the same time. Greed is a danger, Jesus says. And there's some, even in the church, he says, the Apostle Paul said, who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. How to get rich. But Jesus warns here and, and says, be careful about greed. To the man who wants part of his family inheritance, be, be, be careful that greed doesn't come in. In fact, the Apostle Paul says something that is just totally un-American. He says in 1 Corinthians 6 to the church's people who were being wronged by somebody and they took the other person in the church to court to get their rightful amount of money back. And the Apostle Paul said, you're already defeated. Why wouldn't you rather be cheated or wronged? instead of going to court to get your what you feel is your fair share. Paul had never been to America, evidently. You always press for your own. You always make sure they give you all that's rightfully yours. But Paul said you'd be better off just to be cheated or give up your right rather than to make a scene before the unsaved world and bring the kingdom of God down. Why not be wrong. Why not rather be cheated? That doesn't go with the success is the abundance of material things that our world says. But Jesus says success is being rich towards God. Knowing that things don't last. The Bible says that we brought nothing into this world and we're taking nothing out. In spite of what that couple said on, this, on the thing. If they have one casket and him or her both in it, how much stuff are they going to get in there? It must all be cryptocurrency or something. It doesn't last. In fact, he says, be content with what you have. He says, godliness with contentment is great gain. And having food and clothing will be content with that. Are we? In fact, he warns 
in that same passage in, in uh, 1 Timothy 6. He said, those who want to get rich, not those who are rich, those who want to get rich will fall into a temptation and a trap and many foolish and harmful desires that will plunge people into ruin and destruction. And then he says, the one that's quoted so much, for the love of money, not money, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And that's not the worst part of the verse. The worst part of the verse is this. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith. They've lost their souls and pierced themselves with many griefs. <coughs> but we want more, more, more. Even though Jesus said it's harder for a rich man to get to heaven than for the camel to go through the eye of the needle. He's saying it's very difficult. He's saying your chances of going to heaven went significantly down if you become rich. And yet in America we say, I'd like to try it. I'd like to get rich. I'd like to win the lottery. Because I wouldn't be like the other ones who won it. I would be different. Knowing not to put your hope in it, even if God gives you wealth. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God. <coughs> Jesus said, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where thieves break through and steal and moth and rust corrupt, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and thieves do not break in and steal. For he says, for wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. He said another place, you can't serve God and money. You can't serve two masters. How do we become rich towards God? How do we lay up? Rick Warren talks about it when we give to our church, when we give tithing to our church, we are laying up treasures in heaven. When we help somebody to go on a mission trip or support somebody going, when we send a kid to camp, we have opportunity to hear the gospel. When we support missionaries, when we support the Bibles being sent to Iran and Iraq and when we die and get to heaven, there may be somebody that comes up to us and says, thank you for investing in me. But I don't know you. I'm in heaven because of you. You cared enough. You bought a Bible. You bought me a ticket for that life-changing event. Or you gave me a book that pointed to Jesus. When we spend our money and the things that we have on the good news to villages who have never heard, we have laid up treasures in heaven. When we do what we can to help somebody along the way, we lay up treasures in heaven. Jesus said that you'll not even give a cup of cold water in my name, that you won't receive a reward for that. You won't be rewarded. Even a cup of cold water. You're laying up treasures in heaven if you're doing it in his name. If you're shoveling snow in his name, you're laying up treasures in heaven. You're being rich towards God in the things that you do. Coming to church to worship him, to bring somebody, to <clears throat> give somebody gas who's out of gas money. We're laying up treasures in heaven. One song says, you may have a fancy car, brand new house that shines by far. You may live to be a hundred years old, but if you have not been saved, it all ends with the grave. But I want us to be together in heaven. You may be a millionaire wearing clothes beyond compare. You may have the best that money can buy. But if the blood is not applied, then in hell you'll lift your eyes. But I want us to be together in heaven. We sing a song, uh, I'd rather have Jesus. We want to close with that song. 
But I wonder if we can honestly say, it. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. Would we? Or for $10 million, what are we willing to do? What is success? Is it about having lots of money, about having a fancy house? Jesus said it's not. It's laying up treasures in heaven. It's being rich towards God. Let's sing that song and think about the words as we sing it as the piano or whoever's going to play will come. It's 506. The good news is, whether you're rich or poor, it doesn't make any difference. Jesus died for everyone. He paid the price. We say something about, I've been redeemed. That means somebody paid a price that I can go free. I was kidnapped by Satan and my sins, and Jesus paid the ransom, and I was set free. If you just, he said, it, it, it doesn't make any sense to us to think, oh, I, I gotta be a better person. I gotta act better. I gotta quit saying cuss words. I gotta quit doing this bad thing, and then I'll be a good person. No, Jesus says, just come like you are and say, God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Jesus already died for all those sins. If we put our trust in him and believe that God said that's pain enough. My son dying in your place on a cross is pain in full for all of your sins. All you have to is believe and receive it to ask him for it. And then we'll realize that I'd rather have Jesus because he's going to last forever. Heaven's going to be 10 billion years and just beginning. You can be the richest person on earth. It's only going to last 80 to 100 years, and it's over. We brought nothing into this world, and we're taking nothing out. We are taking relationships out. The people that we've helped, the people that we've told about Jesus, the people we've encouraged along the way, we're taking those to heaven with us, but not any stuff, all the stuff left behind. Page 506. Page 506. streets out of it. The things that we think are so great here will be nothing there. Father, help us to live a successful life so that we'll hear the pearly gates click behind us and hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Father, that's success. Help us, Lord, today to hear your word against all the lies that are telling us every day that our life is not complete until we have this phone or this car or this thing. Father, remind us of the words of Jesus that a man's life does not consist in how much stuff that he has. 
And for those who don't know you yet, Lord, may they this morning reach out to you and find forgiveness and find eternal life in you and find that they are fully loved by you. In Jesus' name, and amen.